This profile shows England's Queen Elizabeth II. This one, the first, crowned about 400 years prior. And here you see Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, a social network hosting over 2 billion profiles. The board game Settlers of Catan has its players competing for control over a utopian island. In Silicon Valley, where Facebook is located, the game has recently become somewhat of a phenomenon, being played at company meetings or even job interviews. The application process of Christopher Hatton seems just as frivolous. He accomplished something very rare in Elizabeth's England when he rose up the political ranks as someone who wasn't even born into high nobility, eventually becoming the Queen's Lord Chancellor. The beginning of his career was later described as having entered the court by the Galliard, so literally by dancing. In the letters of Venetian ambassador Paolo Tiepolo, he describes Elizabeth's insistence on daily performances, both as participant and close observer. England wasn't really an exception though. At courts throughout history, formal dance was front and center as spectacle and mandatory activity, sometimes even for the monarchs themselves. And this is something I never quite understood. With all their power and influence, what exactly made these people base at times vital decision making on something like this? What you see here is an honest effort to follow the instructions in historical sources very faithfully. But when we imagine dance, what do we actually expect? Here we have the Arbo Galliard and the Carrozzo Galliard. All right, so all of this seems to leave us with two possible explanations. Either one of the most powerful women in history really was a giant dork, or there is something we are missing. Perhaps we should be judging statespeople by their dancing. When Elizabeth was 28, the Book of the Courtier was published, an English translation of Il Cortegiano by Baldessar Castiglione. You can think of it as the somewhat more easygoing little brother of Machiavelli's Prince, a book about When you play the Game of Thrones you win, or you die. While the Cortegiano advises on how to avoid embarrassing yourself, on 330 pages of rules about dress code or small talk and why winning at board games isn't always smart. The main reference for this student-teacher dialogue is Roman and Greek antiquity, and in particular Plato, who described the inner workings of a state as analogous to a human soul, and as Castiglione saw the soul and the body as two sides of the same coin, his list of the courtier's chief qualities included not only to be good at chess, not too good, but also to dance well. The dance that opened Christopher Hatton's door into Elizabeth's court was called a galliard, the form she preferred dancing herself, to the point where it became the Queen's signature, with the basic rhythm going. While this anthem was written much later, the composition John Dowden had dedicated to Elizabeth was, what else could it be, a galliard. Many 
of John Dowland's compositions were dedicated to someone, be it the Earl of Essex, the Lady Rich, Lord Chamberlain or Lady Russell. As with most of his colleagues, his livelihood depended on support from his patrons, and so the dedications were often a means of showing gratitude or gaining their favor. Strikingly, all of these dedications adhere to some form of dance. The pavan, galliard, a main or jig, though as a single lute is hardly any louder than two pairs of shoes and parquet, these pieces were likely not even meant to accompany actual dancing, but much rather be shared within court society networks. Penelope was Robert's sister, a favorite of Elizabeth, later famously beheaded. Lady Russell's husband had translated the courtier, and her sister was the mother of Sir Francis Bacon. It's not just that everyone sort of knew everybody else, but was also related in one way or another to at least one patron of John Dowland. <laughs> That's how all of these people are even relevant to us today, as members of a tight social network preserved in thousands of letters and secret documents. Our access to all these artifacts, the stories of their owners and what eventually became of them, gives us insight into a microcosm of actual biographies, not just someone's convenient dreams. Every new link creates new meanings, as with Lady Russell's other nephew, Robert Cecil, Secretary of State and patron to Glenn Gould's favorite composer, who is... Ready? One, two, three. Orlando Gibbons. You mean the, 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 the original? Uh... There is only one that I'm aware of. <laughs> What Orlando Gibbons had based his dedication to his patron on was John Dowland's Lacrimae, a set of pavans originating from his song Flow My Tears. Despite the pavan being a dance, these seven tears were much rather meant to be played on a set of vials, another English fashion from the Cortegiano, just like the lute song. But it's a French book that really begins to explain Elizabeth's obsession with the galliard. Like the courtier, this 200-page dancing manual is written as a platonic dialogue between student and teacher with illustrations for every single movement. Arbo, the teacher, defines the galliard as a sequence of five steps followed by a cadence, a short standstill after a jump, apparently so important that the book's fictional student even bears its name, the Capriole. And what follows on the next pages is a diagram assigning a step to each single note of the rhythm. Arbo's motivation for all of this becomes clear in the book's preface, when his student predicts that posterity would be ignorant of these new dances for the same reason the present had lost those from the past, like the Italian court of Ferrara more than a hundred years earlier, where the courtier Domenico da Piacenza addresses dances' existential question. He writes that although its opponents may call it a waste of time, it was the wise Aristotle who recommended it, 
a demonstration of the intellect, requiring a sense of rhythm, memory, agility, style, spacing, and a sixth quality, phantasmata. Aristotle had used the term for what the inner eye sees, impressions he compared to those on wax, a material used on the erasable writing tablets common throughout antiquity. Domenico da Piacenza slightly twists that meaning and describes phantasmata as requiring the dancer to appear, only for some instances, like having seen the head of Medusa, as the poet would say. So what he means is turning to stone, standing absolutely still only for the shortest moment. When all of this was written, the painter Pisanello worked at the same court as Domenico. He belonged to a generation of artists who re-established the portrait genre after most medieval art had depicted individuals as idealized mannequins, generic with some distinguishing feature. What most inspired Pisanello were coins from antiquity showing the profiles of Roman emperors, a lost tradition that he incorporated into his own way of painting the sitters' profiles and portraying them on medals, re-establishing the art form. Pressed into coins, these miniature portraits not only leave an impression in wax, but also have a way of spreading around. If you happen to be watching from the UK, you probably carry a portrait in your pocket right now. Elizabeth's likeness was stamped into her wax seals and she made the goldsmith Nicholas Hilliard into England's most prominent painter. His so-called miniatures were usually much too tiny for hanging on a wall, made to fit inside the palm of a hand, carried in pockets or sometimes on a chain. Over the course of the Queen's life, Hilliard painted several miniatures of her as well as members of her court. In fact, most portraits in this video were his work. Aristotle's Phantasmata connects Nicholas Hilliard's coin-like miniatures and John Dowland's Galliard-like portrait of the Queen. Arbeau's manual perhaps explains Elizabeth's obsession with dance. Each cadence allows for another emphasis to be struck by Domenico da Piacenza's figurative Medusa and leave another impression behind the court's inner eye. Being the spectator enabled her to read into each dancer's individual character, their profile, who might be dependable, dangerous or harmless. In the end, it was not due to one of the many plots against her when Elizabeth's 45-year reign over England eventually ended. Over the course of the following century, musical portraiture became established practice. Dancers repurposed into a vehicle for expressing character. Even the French tombeau, composed to commemorate someone deceased, was technically an Allemand, but not for actual dancing, like the original Chacona that first came to Spain from South America. But only some decades later, there's already a French chacon that sounds like this. Already not exactly something for your hips, but then there's also today's most famous. Chacona. Maybe this illustrates why performing these court dances today is such a delicate and perhaps even impossible undertaking. It's thinking backwards if we imagine these dances as whatever came before classical ballet, except from a more primitive time. A galliard at England's or another powerful court was about non-verbally communicating your profile in a sometimes fatally competitive environment. 
in Queen Elizabeth's speech to Parliament regarding what led to the execution of her cousin, Mary Stuart, she said, The eyes of many behold our actions. A spot is soon spied on our garments, a blend quickly noted in our doings. For we princes, I tell you, are set on stages in the sight and view of all the world duly observed. the end of this episode but there's still some things I'd like to say so as always I reserved a little extra time. First of all there is a big thanks that I have to send out to Karine Tinney uh, whom you just heard sing. It was only a couple of days before we had the chance to record this footage that I sent out the scores to her and she immediately made the song her own. Not only in the literal sense she really gave it its own voice. Uh, by the way, we also do concerts together, so if you are interested in booking us for a performance, you can either contact uh, Karine via her website or uh, me directly. Next, thanks is uh, going out to Sebastian Palsov, who was the audio and video engineer on this last uh, song, and I guess there isn't really that much to say. I mean, you can see the jump in quality between the usual memo uh, footage and what he created. So thank you, Sebastian. Another thanks I have to extend to Lawrence Dreyfus, who recorded and provided me with a copy of this CD with John Dowland's Lacrimae, together with his consort of vials, incidentally also titled uh, Phantasm. Um, you heard some of the music from this recording in the background of this video. So if you are um, 
interested in delving a little deeper into this Elzebifen musical uh, sphere, this would be my recommended next step. And if you'd like to take uh, an even further step, there's another CD I would like to recommend. It's by a friend of mine, Catalina Vicens. Um, and it contains compositions by Orlando Gibbons. You heard a little uh, tiny excerpt uh, in the video. If you'd like to hear more, I can absolutely recommend this recording uh, by Catalina, who's, by the way, also one of Memo's patrons who make this project possible in the first place. Um, the way it works is that uh, Memo has its own page on a website called patreon.com. Come. And um, there, patrons can um, select a certain amount of money, something like two or three dollars, the price of a cup of coffee, for example. And whenever I release another episode of Memo, uh, this amount is then automatically donated to the project. And all these little micro donations together, they um, come together to uh, form something like a, well, maybe salary, you could say, for all the research and uh, writing, recording, editing that I put into these videos. Here on the left, you can uh, see a list of all the people who have been supporting Memo up until this point. So another big, big thank you that I have to extend to all of you. It's, it's you who uh, make this project possible in the first place. And another special thank you also for uh, Memo's first sponsor, who has been with the project from the very beginning. It's the online string service Cuerdas Pulsadas, uh, where you can find all kinds of strings, not only for lutes, but all the different stringed instruments. If you are considering becoming a patron to Memo yourself or would simply like to find out more about the project, you can find all previous episodes on Memo's own website, musicamemo.com, where you can also sign up to Memo's newsletter, which will inform you by email whenever I release another episode. So I guess what's left to say at this point is that I hope you enjoyed this installment and that you'll be joining me for the upcoming episode of Memo. Mm -hmm.